Hello guys, how's everybody doing tonight, or today, or this morning, or whenever you're listening to me? Um, I hope everybody's staying safe. It looks like we're going to be virtual learning through the rest of this semester, um, which is not ideal, but it's just kind of the hand that we've been dealt, so we have to make the best of it. Um, this is going to be our biggest unit so far. Unit 5 is the European moment, um, the age of revolutions. There's a lot that we're going to be covering over the next four, uh, three or four or five weeks. Um, and we have to move kind of quickly to get through it because we need to be done by Christmas break. So um, there's a lot that we have to, that we have to cover. And... I'm not going to cover all of it today. Um, I've been working on this PowerPoint for AP World for a while. Um, we're going to move up through absolutism. We're going to cover everything for now about the mechanical revolutions, um, also known as the industrial revolutions, but it's more than just the industrial revolution. It's the agricultural revolution and the Industrial Revolution that both happened at the same time. So we're going to talk. We're going to talk mostly about that tonight, um, or this morning, or this afternoon, whenever you're listening to me. Um, and then we're going to move through uh, the intellectual part of the revolution. Um, hopefully next week, even though we don't have class next week, I'm probably still going to upload a video just for AP World History because we really do not have the time to take an entire week off at this point. Um, we've got too much that we've got to get through. So, um, like I said, um, earlier this week, I need you guys to go ahead and get copies of A Tale of Two Cities, um, by Charles Dickens. This is a very good book, um, and, um, a literary classic, but it also is a great look at the French Revolution. <clears throat> and try as I might, it's very difficult to find good literature on the French Revolution, um, <clears throat> there are plenty of books written about it. Most of them are extremely long, um, and difficult to read. So we're not, I don't really want, I don't want to start you guys on citizens because it's 800 pages and it will put you to sleep in the beginning. Um, it's kind of sad really because the French revolution out of all the revolutions is probably my favorite to study. There's so many crazy wild events that happen it would make a great tv series I'm not sure why anybody hasn't made it a tv series yet maybe the scope is too large i don't know but it would be extremely fascinating and amazing to watch anyway that's that's a conversation for when we get into the french revolution later on in this unit which we will um extremely get into it but for now let's talk about the mechanical revolutions agriculture and industry, part one. So the agricultural revolution. Around 1650, English farmers began to revolutionize agricultural production. Um, there had been an initial agricultural revolution back in the Neolithic time period, which basically just involved farming in general. Um, but in general, in Europe, what had happened was most farmers had what is called crop rotation that they would move crops around to different fields. Remember, we've studied about feudalism, that these manors, the, the farms, that basically these people collectively owned in these feudal societies. Well, they didn't really collectively own them, but they collectively ran them. And they would move crops around in a rotation system because what they found was that if you kept growing the same crop in one place, eventually the soil would become too exhausted to continue producing uh, vegetation. So they learned pretty early on that they needed to kind of change the way that they operated. What farmers started to find out around 1650 and through most of the 1700s was that they didn't actually have to leave fields completely barren for any level of time. That They were actually crops that they could grow on those fallow fields that would be that would also naturally replenish the soil so that they could continue growing things there, especially like turnips 
and clover. And they, they, and these were crops that you could also use to like do things like eat. Um, you can eat turnips. Uh, you can grow clover and make it into hay for farm animals or, or let farm animals roam on it. So people started to fi- figure out that they didn't have to leave any fields fallow. And this helped increase the amount of production all of a sudden that farmers were able to get on their farm areas. Um, not only were they able to do that, um, but they also started practicing what is called the enclosure method. We would just call it fenced in around here. Um, but basically they started fencing in farm areas um, that were used for growing crops. Now you may say, well, why does that matter? And and the reason that it matters is because people began to be able to basically um, purchase or declare privately owned farms. Now in the feudal times, everything was common. Everything was owned in common. It really was Well, it really wasn't owned by the people, the serfs, the peasants who worked it. It was owned by a landlord, Um, but they all worked it in common. They all worked it together. They took what they needed um, to survive on, and they basically lived the subsistence living. Well, with the enclosure method, people start privately owning these large farms, and they start making farm operations for themselves. No longer are they taking orders from some kind of feudal lord who's forcing them to, um, you know, produce a certain amount of, of goods that are then given over to somebody else. They're able to actually grow this for themselves, for their own production means, um, and for their own profits, um, which is going to drastically also increase the amount of farming that's happening because now all of a sudden people are able to farm for profit. Um, and that increases the desirability for people to want to farm and no longer are they being forced to do it. Now that, that's not to say that there isn't feudalism still happening. Like feudalism is still happening in Europe and will exist in places in Europe into the 1800s. But for the most part, feudalism is dying off. Um, people, uh, the, you know, the, the black plague happened. Um, Several other events happen. There's all this money that's coming in from different places, from trade routes. You know, like we talked about with the Ottoman Empire, also trade coming in from the New World. There's this new merchant class that that is going to, you know, be called the bourgeoisie. We might as well just go ahead and start calling them that. Um, in this unit, the bourgeoisie, basically this this merchant level, this professional level group of people, business owners, essentially. Um, and the same can be said for the farming communities that a lot of these farmers are going to develop their own, uh, or they're going to, they're going to have their own farms, their own plots of land that they're farming for themselves, for their own money, for their own purposes. Um, Europeans also revolutionized the plow. Now the plow had been in existence for a long time. It was actually a Chinese invention, but the Europeans, uh, revolutionized the plow to the point where they're able to hook it up to farm animals, which they hadn't been able to do before, or not very effectively. And they're able to till, you know, multiple layers of, uh, or multiple lines of, of crops you know, all of a sudden, whereas before it was, it was much more time consuming. So this allows them to rapidly grow the size of their farms because they're able to plant so many more, um, so many more crops than they had been able to before. So all of that, Here's just a couple of examples. You've got, um, you know, like say you have four fields here. You've got one field that's that's growing turnips and clover. These two fields right here are actually replenishing the soil. Um, then you've got barley and wheat on two other fields. Um, and this diversification helps in, increase the uh, amount of nitrogen and other um, chemicals that are in the soil. Um, and then here you've got a picture of a plow, which, hooks, which is hooked up to a couple of oxen. Um, which I think this this relief had come uh, originally was made like in the 16 or 1700s. But it just kind of shows that uh, Europeans have kind of really come a long way in terms of uh, the way that they uh, went about farming. Now, why is this a big deal? Um, the increased efficiency in farming led to a lack of demand for farm workers, driving many to move to cities across Europe. So before it had been very 
it was very difficult to have a large scale farm. Now all of a sudden farmers don't need as much help. They're using, um, you know, they're using farm animals to um, assist with planting um, or, you know, they're able, they've got different other tools other than just plows that they're able to use on farms and they don't need to have so much labor force available to them. And also the end of feudalism means that people are free to leave the farm. So before where people were kind of forced to stay on the farm in order to help, um, you know, with the crops, now all of a sudden people are able to leave the manors and they start moving to cities because they're looking for work. Um, also, this increased uh, farm production led to surpluses in farmed goods, which allowed many workers across Europe to move away from subsistence living. So subsistence living means that you're just basically um, farming just enough to survive. All of a sudden, farmers aren't thinking like that anymore. They're thinking in terms of profit. Um, so that means you're not having to pay as many workers. So people, again, are moving out, out of, um, farms and into the cities, but they're also able to focus on other things. They're not necessarily worried about starving to death all the time. Um, because you have these large scale farmers that are producing enough food. They can feed a lot of people. Um, and really all you need to do is just make sure that you have some kind of job that's going to give you the opportunity to pay back, uh, or to buy, you know, the food that you need. Um, and this led to an increase in supply of workers from many factories across Europe and especially in England. Now all of a sudden you have a labor force that is available to help push industry in the direction that it needs to go. So that the agricultural revolution helped spur the beginning of the industrial revolution. And the industrial revolution is going to take us way beyond uh, the French revolution. So really we're only going to focus on the beginning of, of the industrial revolution. So we're not going to talk about railroads yet. We're not going to talk about steam, uh, steam boats yet. We're not going to be talking about uh, the Bessemer process and telegraphs. Those things are going to come when we get closer to world war one. We'll talk about the second part of the industrial revolution when we get to that point. But for now we're going to talk about what the people who are going through the revolutions that are about to happen. So the American revolution, the French revolution, the English civil war, what's the world look like that they're dealing with. So in addition to the growth of England's agricultural output, England had the perfect geography to move to an industrial economy. Um, and that's important when we, when we think about the industrial revolution, that it's very based on geography when it happens. It can't just have, it's not just a product of uh, English or European superiority because if it was based on intellectual superiority, then most likely the, in, the Industrial Revolution would have already happened. It would have happened in China uh, several hundred years before. Really, as luck would have it, society moved along just at enough pace that at this point, all of a sudden, England becomes the perfect location for this to happen. It's almost like the, the tech bubble with, with the United States and how... Um, the United States has moved along just to the right point where tech is able to, you know, expand exponentially here. Well, the same could be true of England um, in the 16 1700s. The main thing was that fast flowing rivers cut across England and iron ore deposits were plentiful. Not only iron ore, but also coal. I should have added coal in there. Coal is in abundance in England. So is iron ore and so is fast flowing rivers. This is going to be very important because a lot of the in, the, the uh, inventions that are going to take that are going to happen around here, especially for factories, involve water power. That water turns turbines. You've all have seen mills before. If you go down to Mill Springs, you can see one. Um, but water moving helps to turn these turbines, which creates power for um, different things to operate. Now they don't have necessarily machines in the uh, sense that we would think of them today, but they, but basically these rotors were able to turn large machines, which were able to get things moving. Um, also, you had some adva advances in t steam technology as well as the use of water power to turn turbines, which led to massive growth in manufactured goods and textiles across England. So um, this is a pretty good picture. You have all these pulleys here, and basically you have like one or several larger uh, turbines that are being turned either either in small enclosed places by steam power from heat 
or by just rapidly moving water, which was very abundant in England. There's several rivers that are moving um, in England um, close to coal uh, deposits and iron ore deposits, which makes England, like I said, the perfect place for this to happen. So some early textile inventions. Um, there are four main inventions that helped revolutionize the textile industry. You don't have to know all of these. I would make sure that you are familiar with the spinning jenny and the cotton gin, uh, which from Eli Whitney. Now, the three of these people were, were uh, English, and one of them is an American, um, and I'll leave it to you to guess which one is the American. But anyway, um, these inventions helped increase textile production. And remember, textiles, if you don't remember, um, are basically fabric type things so think of clothes think of blankets think of things like that they're that are sewn or woven together um, they helped increase textile production in england um, and one way that we can measure that is that in 1750 england was only consuming two and a half million pounds of cotton which is actually quite a bit um, especially if you've ever held cotton it is very light so to get two and a half millions a uh, million pounds of cotton. You had, I mean, you're talking about an astronomical amount of cotton, or at least it would seem that way. Um, but by 1850, just a hundred years later, England was consuming 588 million pounds of cotton. Um, and a lot of that obviously is being imported from different places around the world, especially the United States. And is a big part of the reason why the South um, before the Civil War was so certain that England would intervene in the war effort because they assumed that the British rely, were rel so heavily reliant on their cotton that they couldn't function uh, without enough cotton to produce textiles for them to make money. The, see, the problem with that, uh, and I'm getting into a sidebar that I don't need to get into, but the problem with that is that as we've learned with mercantilism, um, and as we're going to learn, mercantilism kind of eats its own um, with the policy that there's only there's a finite amount of gold, a finite amount of goods and wealth out there in the world, and you have to collect as much of it as you can. The problem with with insisting that you have more imports, or, or I'm sorry, that you have more exports than imports, is that if everybody thinks that way, somebody's got to be able to, uh, I mean, somebody has to buy your goods in order for you to be able to export it. So... Great Britain in 1860 was at a point where they were forcing other places to take their textiles and that doesn't really lead to a lot of profit. So they didn't really necessarily need American cotton as bad as Americans thought they did, especially because as we're going to learn, the British are busy um, making tons of money on opium by selling it to the Chinese. Anyway, that's neither here nor there right now. We'll get to that in our next unit when we get into imperialism. But um, also in 1788, there were 50,000 spindles, um, which were basically these, these weaving machines um, making textiles across England. But it, only 30 years later, there were over 7 million in England. So you see this exponential growth happening in England at this point. And here's a few examples um, this is the flying shuttle. Um, this is a spinning jenny right here. Uh, and this is a cotton gin. And this is kind of what a factory would have looked like with several spinning jennies or spinning mules. Um, basically these large looms um, that were powered by, you know, the turbines that we mentioned earlier, either water power or steam powered. So early iron production, uh, advances in iron making technology coupled with the abundance of coal and iron or located in England allowed the production of ore in England to grow exponentially. Now, in order to create or smelt iron into something that could be usable, you had to have a lot of heat, which is where coal comes in. Coal burns uh, really high temperatures that helped that helps melt the iron down to make it more amenable so that you can mold it into shapes that you need. Um, in less than 30 years or 50 years, England went from a nation that imported nearly all of its iron to one that exported over 31,500 tons of bar iron. So that's you know, 31,500 times 2,000 to get the amount of actual pounds of bar iron. And that doesn't include all the iron that they were using in the, in the country, which they were using quite a bit um, and imported absolutely no bar iron. 
Um, these advances in technology allowed the English to produce wrought iron, cast iron, and bar iron, which allowed the English to produce steel on a massive scale as well. And we'll get more into steel when we talk about the Bessemer process, because the Bessemer process is going to revolutionize steel, which is going to really kick up the Industrial Revolution once we get into the late 1800s. Uh, but for now, they are using a lot of iron. Um, this is especially important when it comes to like the manufacturing of cannons, um, military weapons, um, carts. Now, we're not to railroads yet. This picture, you have a railroad line. This is a little bit later than our period. Railroads have not come into existence just yet. Um, but they will shortly. Um, but there's a lot of uses that people are able to use iron for. They're, they build bridges out of iron um, and several other things. Um, they use it for construction purposes uh, to make, you know, reinforce houses and buildings. So iron is very important, as you have probably guessed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move into a little bit about the intellectual revolution, and we'll come back to it next week, most likely. Um, the first thing that we need to know about the intellectual movement is we have to li we have to catch back up to where we left off. So now we've, we've moved through the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution. And now we're going to backtrack um, and we're going to go back to the political scene of what was going on, because, you know, up to this point, you know, the agricultural and, re and industrial revolution um, haven't happened yet on the political scene. Um, but the big age that, that I want to talk briefly about, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about absolutism because it's mostly boring, but it's very important for us to understand it because we have to understand the political landscape at the time that all these revolutions start breaking out and why maybe people wanted these revolutions to start breaking out. Uh, and the big theory at the time um, coming out of the Reformation was this idea of absolutism or absolute monarchies. Um, as the Reformation spread across Europe, the Catholic Church um, began to lose power. Basically, the Catholic Church had been the central authority for Europe for several hundred years, even if there were kings or other people, for the most part, the Catholic Church had, had been the connecting power um, and basically asserted its authority over kings and princes and other folks. Um, but with the Reformation and the challenges to that, you know, even in places that remained Roman Catholic, there was still this idea that maybe the Catholic church's power doesn't usurp the power of a monarch in in a place and it creates this power vacuum that needed to be filled and european monarchs were more than willing to step into the void to take the power um, that they viewed as their own um, claiming the theory of divine right european monarchs began to declare themselves sent by god to rule over their kingdoms um, they basically ruled that they had um that they had been appointed by God and placed by God to be rulers in their own kingdoms. Um, and, you know, this was, um, this made it, this made them very powerful. And it also made it hard to refute their power. If the king says he's appointed by God, who are you to say that he isn't? Um, in a nutshell. Um, now, it's more complicated than that. I mean, like the king has to have. I mean, in order for somebody to be in power, you have to have enough people agree to the point that they say that, yes, you are in power. Um, you know, even even unpopular kings still have people who who legitimize and recognize their authority. Um, and in England or not just in England, but in in, in France and other parts of Europe, that's kind of what happens. The nobles who are starting to lose power. Like in, in the time of feudalism, nobles held more power even than the king um, in a technical sense because they could just basically decide they didn't want to follow the king and could raise their own armies. But because of everything that's happening, because of the Reformation, because of the Renaissance, because of the end of feudalism, um, nobles start to lose money. Um, that's an important part that I want you to understand. Nobles at this time start to lose money and they start to lose power and influence because you have this new class of merchants who are making money 
that they didn't have before. You have, you know, you're having to pay people to work on your farms even more money than they ever did just to keep them from leaving. Um, and then on top of that, these kings and queens are bringing in all this new money from, you know, from their, their colonies overseas. So nobles who are not involved in those trades, uh, who are only farming their own land like they had for the last several hundred years, start to lose power. So in order to maintain their power, a lot of them start to come over to supporting the king so that the king supports them. It, it becomes a mutually beneficial relationship. And kings start to look at their nobles um, and, and they're very suspicious of their nobles, we should say. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why. But they start to basically scheme new ways to make sure that they consolidate power through their, through their nobles. And we'll talk about King Louis XIV specifically. And that's the guy that's on this picture. Oh, man, I went too far. This guy right here. This is King Louis XIV, also known as the Sun King. You should probably know that. Louis the Fourteenth is the Sun King. Um, he is the most prominent of all the absolute monarchs. When you think of an absolute monarch, you should think of Louis the Fourteenth. This guy embodies everything about being an absolute monarch. Now, Louis the Fourteenth comes to power at a very young age, and I can't think of exactly what the age is when he comes to be technically the king. But I believe it's age three. Um, so. Obviously, that's not a great situation for a country to be in. Obviously, they're not going to start taking orders from a three-year-old. So his mother becomes the queen regent. She has a lover, technically, who is also a top advisor, um, who is also a cardinal of the Catholic Church named Cardinal Mazarin. Um, that's just a little bit of uh, trivia for you. You don't have to know that. Um, but it is interesting in some ways. You have this guy who's the Catholic Church. He's supposed to be chaste, but maybe he's actually having a relationship with the mother of the person who's actually the king. Anyway, if you get into French politics in the 16 and 1700s, you just got to expect things like that to be happening because there's a lot of it that's happening. Anyway, um, a lot of people in France, especially a lot of nobles, don't really like Cardinal Mazarin, and they don't like taking orders from him. So it causes this noble uprising that happens during Louis XIV's life. It's known as the Fronde. It doesn't actually end up being successful, but it plays a very prominent role in Louis XIV's life and the way that he thinks about the way that he should deal with nobles. So when he, when he finally comes to power at age 22, um, he has this grand strategy that he's actually going to um, build the palace of Versailles. And I should probably have put more um, slides in here about the palace of Versailles. Maybe whenever I come back and we, we talk about this stuff again, maybe I'll include some more pictures of the palace of Versailles because it's truly a remarkable skip spectacle. I mean, we're talking about a, we're talking about basically a city um, where up to 15,000 nobles and servants are going to live along with the king. Um, and it used to be just a hunting lodge. It was a hunting lodge that Louis XIII had built for him to go and just kind of get away from having to be the king in Paris sometimes. But now Louis XIV is going to build Versailles into the most magnificent, out-of-this-world, um, structure, city, whatever you want to call it, that's ever been built. And he's going to force all the nobles in France to come and live with him. Now remember, all these nobles in France, not all of them, but a lot of them, don't have as much money as they used to have. So all of a sudden living in Versailles is like this magnificent treat that it's hard to even express to you how magnificent it is. Um, and it, it actually become it, it gets to a point where being sent home from Versailles was actually this huge slap in the face for nobles. Like they want to do everything they can to make King Louis happy so that they don't get sent home. Um, and it creates this, this opportunity for Louis to really keep an eye on his nobles, but also make sure that he has their loyalty and support. And for that, 
um, they have the assurance from the king that he's always going to try to act in their best interest. Now, that creates a very dangerous dynamic because there are going to be events that happen that are going to set him against the nobility before too long. We're not there yet. Um, it's really not going to be Louis the Fourteenth that has to deal with that. It's really going to be Louis the Sixteenth. Um, and if you know where I'm going with that, I'm going into the French Revolution. But anyway, we'll get to that point, and I promise you it'll be a humdinger when we get there. I wish we could be in person so I could tell you some of these stories in person. But anyway, um, Louis is keeping a close eye on his monarch, on his nobles. And I mean like a really close eye on these, these people. Um, these nobles actually go to plays that Louis the Fourteenth puts on. He just like randomly decides he's going to perform a play. Um, because he's the king and he gets to play the lead role. Um, he may decide to have a choir sing. He may decide to sing to them himself. And we don't even know if Louis XIV is a good singer or not, but the, all the nobles have to listen to him anyway. Um, he hunts a lot. He, um, you know, basically just lives this extravagant life. I mean, like the, every morning when he wakes up, there's like a noble person who is in charge of, of saying good morning to him and making sure that he has a shirt picked out for as soon as he wakes up and he puts on a shirt. There's a noble person who gets to um, sit with him basically when he's in, when he's in the John going to the bathroom. Like there's a guy that is there to help him with that. I mean, Louis the 14th, you know, leaves no stone unturned for people to basically cater to him. And it's not just Louis XIV. There are other absolute monarchs. Peter the Great in Russia comes to mind. Uh, Charles I in England, although he's going to meet a very violent end. Um, you know, um, there are other kings and queens that are going to come about. Really, the whole Romanov family in Germany, the Hohenzoller family uh, in Prussia, which eventually will be Germany. Um these absolute monarchs are everywhere, but Louis the Fourteenth is the most important. If I were to rank somebody below him, I would say, you know, you can get to um, Peter the Great, and then you've got people, you know, lesser than that, like Elizabeth um, the Second, um, or Elizabeth the First, Henry the Eighth in England, um, Louis the Fourteenth, Fifteenth, and Sixteenth. Kaiser Wilhelm eventually when we get to World War One, the whole Romanov family, I think I already said that. Uh, those are the people that we're that we're talking about. So some of the other effects of absolute monarchs. As monarchs assumed complete control, they began engaging in several conflicts with each other to extend control of their empires across Europe. These absolute monarchs loved to go to war with each other. These were like this was like a gentlemanly style warfare okay like i'm talking about like you you end up with these professional soldiers who have these nice fancy uniforms they stand across from each other they shoot at each other and every now and then one of them wins and they exchange some territories with a treaty um that's the kind of wars that they're fighting um king louis the the 14th for example is going to be involved in at least four wars two of which he wins and two of which he loses um the problem with this style of living and trying to expand empires um, is that they become extremely expensive, especially as these empires are engaged in warfare across the world. Um, as they move into colonizing the new world, as we've as we've learned about, you know, we, or we already knew about the English in the Amer- in the American colonies, um, as the French extend their colonies in uh, Canada, as well as a few in the Caribbean, as the Spanish um, increase their colonial holdings in Central and South America, the Portuguese, the Dutch. Um, as they do that, it becomes very expensive to send troops around the world, and they start to fight. You know, They may declare war on each other in Europe, and then all of a sudden all the fighting actually happens in like the United States, like we're going to spend some time before we get to the American revolution talking about the, um, seven years war, also known as the French and Indian war. Um, mostly that's fought in what would, they would have considered the new world. Now that it is fought in other places. Um, and there are naval battles as well to that. Um, 
but but again, that that leads to the cost of having to keep up these professional armies. Um, while that increases the power of the crown, all of a sudden these kings are going to become very powerful because they alone control the militaries. The nobles can't just run a coup and get rid of the king because the king is in charge of the army. Um, but also you have all these technological innovations. Um, you have these new ships of the line. Um, eventually you'll get to metal ships or, or basically steel built ships. But at this point we're still dealing with wooden ones. Um, but it costs a lot of money to build ships. It costs a lot of money to build cannons. It costs a lot of money to build rifles. And then on top of that, you have to pay soldiers wages and then you have to buy bullets and you have to buy shells. And before long, it's going to start to really drain the uh, coffers of these different um, absolute monarchs. That's going to cause a big problem. Um, it's because of that that the the English crown is going to try taxing the American colonies to try to make try to recoup some money from the the Seven Years' War. The same thing is going to happen in France. The French crown is going to go broke. And when we just talked about the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, all this money that these countries are are making, um, they're making a ton of money, especially from overseas colonies. But as they lose wars. Um, like the French do, like when they lose the French and Indian War, all of a sudden sources of their income go down. Um, at the same time, they're having to pay all these costs for standing armies and ships and everything else. And all of a sudden, they're going to find themselves almost flat broke. And that's going to cause a big problem. And I think that's the end of this for now. We'll talk more about their problems later. Here's a few pictures of Louis the Fourteenth. You'll notice every time Louis XIV gets a painting drawn of him of a battle, he's always on top of a hill. His horse is always rearing. He's always looking back at the painter for whatever reason um, while all the chaos is happening somewhere else. So challenges to absolutism are going to start happening really almost immediately as soon as absolute monarchs come into power, especially in England and the first thing that we see is the English Civil War. Now this, I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on this as it deserves. I would encourage you to read about the, the English Civil War whenever you get a chance. It is wild. Um, you have this king, just as a real brief overview of what happens in the English Civil War. You have this king, Charles I. He is extremely unpopular. Uh, there is a parliament in England, but Charles I claims power over them. They try to pass some laws he doesn't like, so he disbands them for like 11, 12 years. He just says, go home. I'm tired of looking at y'all. I'm in power. You're not. You know, and they have to go home. Well, the parliament decides that they need to come back because um, basically Charles finally calls them back because he needs to he needs to wait to raise some taxes because he needs to get some more money because, again, he's an absolute ruler and the crowd needs money. Well, the parliament comes back in and they're like, we still really don't like you. Um, and it, it, it sparks a war between these, these, group, these, these two groups of people. You have royalists who support the crown and you have this other group called roundheads who support the parliament. And they believe that there should be some kind of limited monarchy. Ultimately, this war goes on for like nine years and it has a lot of different phases. I mean, it's not always just, you know, real bloody battle. It's just like this ongoing, you know, contest essentially um, and it eventually ends with um, parliament basically finding Charles I guilty of treason and having him executed um, and this guy who's leading the roundheads the parliamentarians this guy known as Oliver Cromwell takes control um, and is basically a king who decides that, that I mean he's not really a king but he's basically a caretaker of the throne and he wants to help find a king, but they can't find one that he agrees with. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to have to stay as the caretaker of the king because the parliament can't get its act together and decide, you know, in a way that suits me. So basically he rules as the king until he ultimately dies in 1658. So then his son tries to take over. They really don't like him. The parliament doesn't. So Charles the first son, Charles the second comes into the picture and they decide to put him as the king. Um, 
during something that's called the Restoration. So they killed his father, but then they decide to put him on the throne. And, and he and Charles II is like, yeah, this is cool. I mean, if if it was me and this group of people killed my father, I would be a little bit more skeptical than Charles II was. Um, but anyway, eventually, another event happens called the Glorious Revolution in 1688, which basically... Um, is basically an agreement between the parliament and the crown that parliament has the right to decide who will be the successor to the throne and that also they will have a limited constitutional monarchy. Now, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden England goes to the way that Great Britain is today, you know, with the king and queen, where basically their role is entirely ceremonial. The king is going to still have a lot of power. Um, really from now all the way until we get into about World War One, World War Two era when the king and queen finally start to lose their power. But, you know, there's, King George III has a lot of power, you know, when we get to the uh, American Revolution, um, but he doesn't have the same kind of power that Louis the Sixteenth or, or Louis the Fourteenth or Peter the Great has. But and it's because of the English Civil War, which basically ends absolute monarchy in England and institu- institutes a constitutional monarchy. Now, you don't need to know, you don't need to remember all of that, um, but I would remember the name Oliver Cromwell. Um, and I would try to know at least a little bit about the English Civil War because it is, it is important. And that's all we're going to get to today. I'm going to save the Enlightenment for another time because you can see that's the end of my slideshow for now. Um, so, anyway, I hope you took notes because that's part of the assignment. So make sure that you're taking notes. Oh, there I am. So you can see I'm in my basement. It's very dark. Um, so make sure that you take notes and turn those in. And, again, hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. Hopefully I'll get another video to you, out to you next week, even though I know we're not in school um, because of the governor's mandates and because of COVID, which you know really stinks. But anyway, I, I, I need to put that out. It'll just be homework for you guys. I'm sorry. You know, this is the AP life. I don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm actually in college now working on the master's degree and we didn't stop meeting for COVID. We have still got stuff to turn in. So, that's just kind of the way it is in college. So I um, hope everybody's staying safe. If you have any questions, anything comes up, make sure that you reach out to me and let me know. Um, but anyway, if I don't see you, which I probably won't see you, but if I don't hear from you between now and Thanksgiving, I um, hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving and I hope everybody stays safe. Anyway, I will talk to you guys later.